What is going on, everybody, and welcome to the GLL Apex Legends series, coming to you live from a dark and brooding night in Stockholm, Sweden. My name is Parla, and I will be your desk host for the duration of this weekend. But I am not the only talent in the studio over the course of this time. I'm also joined by four other people, two of which are on the desk, starting with Glitter Explosion. Then on the very end, we've got Onset. Guys, great to have you here. Great to be here. I mean, I'm really, really excited for this event. I think everybody's been waiting a little bit to see some more competitive Apex action, and so I'm ready to get this thing started. Yeah, I think the anticipation has been building for quite long enough now, to be honest with you. Finally, we are here. We are ready to get some more Apex Legends competitive play in front of people's eyes. I just can't wait to watch these teams go at it. I'm very, very excited as well, guys. And now talking about the two other people joining us who will be helping us on the server with the casting, we've got Bravo and Dreadnought. Guys, great to see you. Hey, guys. Yeah, I think we, we just echo you. We're excited to see uh, more Apex on our screens, and I'm a of course, excited to be back in the booth with Dread and Dread. You and I, we we have a lot of new stuff to talk about in Apex Legends compared to where we were a few months ago in Poland. Yeah, because last time, you know, sitting with Kings Canyon, obviously this tournament is going to be played on the first one on World's Edge, yep. so we get that. Uh, along with that, we got Crypto, though sadly I don't think we're going to be seeing too we'll see. much of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then we got the new Gibraltar and the Charged Rifle, right? Like, yep. what do these things look like at the top level of competitive Apex? And for the first time, we get a glance at it. Yeah, and of course, a lot of new stuff coming in. Also on the December third patch, we've got some new stuff we'll oh, talk yeah. about throughout the whole show with uh, gold armor changes, knockdown shields, and stuff like that. So excited to get into the games when we can. Absolutely. Well, we'll check in with you guys when those games are ready. A pleasure to have you here. Now, it's my first foray into Apex Legends, but I have the feeling from speaking to you guys before that you've all met each other before. You've been at a bunch of these events. You're all kind of like veterans of the scene, so to speak. I mean, we were lucky enough, I guess, if you want to phrase it that way, to work with each other already in Poland. It was an experience, to say the least, and it's just kind of nice to be back with the same crew again. On set. I think we're all super excited to be working with each other again. As I say, we were lucky enough to be involved in the preseason Invitational. Uh, it was an incredible event. Uh, it really gave us uh, a real good look out on the landscape of Apex Legends and what teams and what regions were kind of superior. And, you know, TSM came out and just reminded us all that they are the top dogs at the moment. But yeah, it's just great to be back here working with everyone. And uh, I just can't wait to watch these players again and these teams again just go up against each other and show what they can do here on World's Edge. Yeah, I mean, there have been many developments over time with regards to the game. Do you expect to see any surprises today in terms of gameplay? Ooh, well, speaking of that specifically, there were some new changes made to the map very recently, and I'm excited to see how the players adapt. I mean, they're professionals for a reason. They, this kind of comes with the nature of BR in general. You know, the name of the game is to be able to adapt to those extenuating circumstances, so... Yeah, I think some changes are always interesting. It always adds a little bit of spice to the uh, to the occasion, as we always like to see. But uh, yeah, I mean, from speaking of changes, a lot of people might not have watched competitive Apex since Poland. And as the guys on the desk there were talking about, you know, there's changes huge changes, not only to weaponry, but we have new weapons, we have a new map in World's Edge, which plays a lot different to what we saw on King's Canyon. And sometimes big changes mean changes in, you know, teams performances. So it's going to be very, very interesting to see how the lay of the land is after we're done here this weekend. It's going to be a great two nights of Apex Legends action. And talking about the two nights, let's show you exactly what's in store and get up that schedule. So, We'll be playing tonight and tomorrow. We have two different regions, which we'll be playing six matches on each night. You can see we're starting things off today at 7 p.m. and hopefully be finishing off the, well, starting the final match at 10.45. Then we have those six games tomorrow as well, starting at six, and then starting off the final match at 9.45. This, of course, is going to be starting off with the EMEA region, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And then in the second portion of the evening, when we hit about midnight, I think, we'll be heading on over to America. Two regions, $50,000 on the line. You can see how that prize distribution will be going on the right-hand side of the screen. Then on the left, we have the score system. Finishing first place will net you 12 points, then we descend right down to the bottom where you'll only get zero for placing 16th to 20th. And of course, you get one point per kill. $25,000, guys, per region. That is a lot of money to play for, as well as bragging rights. And the teams that will be playing for those prizes are on screen now for Europe. Any of those teams stand out to you, Glitter? 
Oh, I mean, I mean, there's a ton of teams in this bracket alone that stand out to me, but one team that I really would like to touch on a little bit is Luminosity Gaming. If you guys don't know who they are or if you watch the Apex Preseason Invitational, they are the former 789 team. They were previously free agents, and now, you know, I'm really happy that they got picked up by LG. They had an outstanding debut performance at the preseason Invitational, and I'm really looking forward to seeing if that was beginner's luck or if they can kind of have a repeat performance here. On set, what about yourself? Uh, I think you've made a great pick there in Luminosity. <laughs> to see a team come out of nowhere, perform so well, and get picked up by such a huge org is always such a fantastic thing to see happen. But I'm going to be talking about Gamers Origin because they were one of the standout teams at the preseason Invitational, and maybe not a team that stuck in the memory for a lot of teams, but you look back on their performance and, you know, we're talking about a team here who placed in the top five, you know, and any team at a preseason invitational when you have everyone at a LAN event for the first time that puts in that kind of performance is going to be talked about. They were also on match point along with a lot of teams for a long time. If one thing could have gone right for them, if they would have, I think there was a 1v1v1 situation that they were in where TSM actually ended up winning things. If they win that one battle, we're talking about them being the best team in the world, arguably, at the moment, and people wouldn't be talking about TSM, but they didn't have that clutch factor. It'd be interesting to see if they've developed from there last time we saw them uh, to when we're going to see them this weekend. Looking at the 20 teams from Europe, it's very interesting to me to see so many big names from e in terms of esports organizations that have got involved in Apex Legends now. We're seeing Fnatic, Virtus Pro, Alliance, Alliance, Gambit, like there's a great representation there from already the thoroughbreds in esports. So that must be nice for the scene to know that these big organizations are getting involved, Glitter. Absolutely. And not only is it a massive you know, support system for the scene, but you did mention one of the teams, Alliance, that I would like to point out. They are one of the teams that qualified in. They did not get directly invited. Not only did they qualify in, but they blew everybody's points out of the water. Like they did incredibly well, which was kind of, you know, a nice change from what happened in Poland. They didn't have the best showing in Poland. So I'd like to see, you know, what they've changed since that event. Is it the way, is it their play style? Is it just kind of maybe gathering what they were doing as far as like their thoughts and their decision making? Did they change that up at all? But clearly whatever they changed is working and I'd kind of like to see how that plays out today. On set, anything else that you'd like to mention with think regards to the teams? Talking about um, one thing we should talk about a little bit is, um, you know, we're talking about our qualifying teams. This is a very different scenario now because we're playing just a straight up battle royal. Every single team is in the same lobby and it is, we saw the system of point scoring and how you're going to win this tournament essentially. To qualify for this was a little bit different. They had a fantastic performance in qualification, but it was a kill race. It wasn't this same battle royale style where, you know, we're looking for who's going to place the best, picking up kills along the way. It's a point total. This was about kills. So the They've shown they can slay Alliance. They've shown that they can get kills on the board and they're very individually skilled. But when it gets down to those end circles, do they have that decision making and that ability to execute in game that's going to pick up those wins in this in this stacked, stacked lobby? Having seen competitive Apex Legends over time and as you just addressed, you know, here the rule set is a bit different. You know, this time it's not just a simple kill race. There are a lot more factors going into this. And then along with the other little changes or potentially big changes that our casters alluded to, do you think that today is going to be a big test for many of these teams, if not all of them. Undoubtedly, I think I think I think we'd both agree that you know, this is going to be a test, not only because it's a new map, but it's the first tournament that we've had here where there's money on the line. And we all know, as soon as you get into any sort of situation, you can scrim as many times as you want at home. You can practice the situations that you get into a thousand times. You can look up every end circle, know every single thing that you need to know about the game to win a game. Put money on the line. All of a sudden, hands get shaky. Yep. All of a sudden, things change. Uh, so I'm always very interested to see who can deal with the pressure in tournament situations. I yeah. think... Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to just throw it on to you, Glitter, because that dynamic is definitely very important when there's much more on the line, right? Not only is that dynamic important, but when we're talking about what's different, I think the only thing that's remained the same for the players from Poland to this event is the scoring system. Mm. They had the same point system for Poland, but other than that, it's completely different. Weapons have been tweaked. Like you said, it's a totally different map. There's new legends. There's new armor. There's new knockdown shields. Like... They have to completely regroup from the months of practicing that they put into Poland to now. Yeah, guys, it's going to be definitely a test for these teams to, to put everything on the line today. I'm also excited because we've got two extra special guests in the studio right now. We've got Pathfinder <laughs> behind me and on set. You, you're not under Wraith too much me. pressure from Wraith, it's right? a little bit of a scary yeah, look. Yeah, she, she's just, looking kind of on edge. I'm gonna, Pathfinder's more of a, like, a friendly character to have behind <laughs> you. Like, he's going to tap you on the shoulder. He's going to make sure you're okay and yeah. you're doing all right. I'm just a little bit wor worried about 
Wraith. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you. He's got my back. Scary. He's got the GLL logo on his chest. Talking about these legends, there has been a mess developing in turn, well, or at this point it is developed, but there's a, a mess at the moment in terms of the legends that these teams are picking. Can we talk a bit about that, starting with you, Onset, and then head on over to Glitter? Well, it's been a bit of a development. I think we all saw uh, pretty much the same composition of legends uh, back in Poland and on King's Canyon. You had your Watson, you had your Wraith playing, you had your Pathfinder. And that was because of it just worked for the map. However, here, we're moving on to a new map. We're moving on to World's Edge, and we are seeing with character changes as well, with buff to certain characters, more characters becoming and legends becoming more viable in the game, especially when we're looking at end circle situations, I think. On King's Canyon, we had a lot of end circles that would end in cover with buildings, and a lot of teams could play around that and sort of set up and use their Watson uh, ult and their Watson, you know, to defend those situations. Here, we're having a lot of end circles that end in wide open space. So Gibraltar becomes into it. We need that dome. You need little different things. And I'm seeing a little bit of caustic play very, very recently from a few teams as well. And I think that's pretty smart when we're starting to see those open circles. If you can get a couple of traps down, if you can get that ult going, you're going to slow everyone down and you can have a real opportunity to win these games. I'm not really sure how many people are going to commit to taking the caustic. I that just is, like, like the that's fact that it's play. like, you know, it's the toe in the water, isn't it? It's like, hey, we could. Of course, it could be viable here. I, I like the idea of just trying it out. I, I think people are going to be a little bit more comfortable with Gibraltar, especially because of how useful some of his utility is in those um, open areas that you're talking about on this map. I think, though, and I could, I could be wrong, but I feel like there's definitely going to be a good percentage of the lobby that kind of sticks to what they oh, know yes. and what it, what has already worked. And we're go still going to see a lot of that meta, of that original meta so far that hasn't changed. But I'm very excited for the people that are willing to kind of change it up, not only on their own team, but the more variety we get in Legends across squads, I feel like the more interesting gameplay we could potentially see on this map. Risk versus reward, I guess, is the topic that we're sort of touching upon here. In a situation like this, is it likely that anybody is going to be risking changing compositions and doing new strats going into a competition that has so much on the line. Uh, I, I feel like it's not a case of a risk at this point because all of these teams would have been practicing, especially using Gibraltar. I think he's now just like a viable pick for a lot of these teams. He seems to, I think that you're going to see Watson, you're going to see Wraith. We all know what they do. You know, Wraith has the ability to stay alive at the end of uh, the end circles. You have Watson, who's always obviously so vital in those end circles as well and to hold down positions. But there's kind of a little bit of interchanging now with Pathfinder, which is uh, some people would see, you go back to Kings Canyon, no one would ever think that that would be a possibility, but his mobility is not as vital sometimes as Gibraltar because of the fact that Gibraltar, you know, has a slightly higher HP, so he can take a few more shots. He can also with his uh, with his arm shield, and then you also have the fact that those the ult and the, the bubble that he has for those open circles are more valuable in the end game than Pathfinder can use with his ult and with, with his abilities. So Gibraltar certainly is a legend that is so well practiced now that I don't think it's a risk versus reward thing. It's just a, a matter of who's comfortable in using them in this situation. Guys, could we talk a bit about specific players? Because that's something that I would like to get to know more about. We know, so having spoken to you guys beforehand, I know that all the players have a great level of mechanical skill. They all have to be comfortable in different situations. Nonetheless, we know across esports, um, games in general, that there can be star players that will stand out and that we expect a lot from. Do either of you have any particular players that we should look out for or I should? I, I know that you have one that you, <laughs> you've been wanting to talk about with uh, potatoes, but I feel like that the, <laughs> the players... Sorry, it's just to say potatoes. It makes me laugh. I'm a, I'm a child. I can't help it. <laughs> I, I'm actually looking forward to seeing some things come out of the players on G2. They have proven themselves to be pretty consistent at this point, whether they were playing with a slightly different roster at, at X Games now, or they have their set roster from Poland. They have set the bar really, really high for themselves, especially considering how new they were as a roster with Poland. So I'm, I'm looking forward to see what they can do. I mean, a seventh place finish in, in Poland, you exactly. set yourself those high standards. And, you know, we're talking about specific players. You're looking at Mimu and Rete and Zero Nothing. Uh, you know, Mimu was a player who was very impressive for me uh, back in Poland. And one of those players that I think caught the eye a lot of the time, especially when we were looking at a European region and we weren't quite sure what to expect from a lot of teams, a lot of players. Um, looking across both regions, uh, there's always going to be players to look out for. But VP is another team that I'm keeping my eye on. And uh, PJ is a player that I am definitely was excited about watching back in Poland as well very aggressive player, likes to finish kills, likes to be aggressive and kind of engage in fights as soon as damage is done. So he's certainly going to be a player to watch. But 
<laughs> I'm going to talk about my boys on Brotatoes. I saw Brotato this from Brotato. a mile away. So we talk about the invited teams and you know all of this experience they have. The Brotatoes, they have Shiv, <laughs> and Shiv is one of my favourite people in the world to watch on Twitch. He's a uh, he's a lot of fun. He's obviously incredibly mechanically skilled as well to get this far. But shout out to Shiv, I love your stream, and uh, I'm really excited to see him and his teammates do very very well this tournament. I believe in them. Brotatoes all the way. Was this part of your contract? You know, <laughs> to plug your mate? No. On set. He know he doesn't know who I am. I know he's a total <laughs> fanboy. Oh really? Yeah. 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 Have you not even met in person? You tell, me. All right, tell me in person that if someone said to you, you have a choice of choosing G2 or Brotatoes as your favorite <laughs> team, and you know nothing else about them, Parla, who are you going to pick? It's a tough choice, but Brotatoes <laughs> there we go. Thank like you. a very um, attractive option. Yeah. Uh, the name on its own strikes fear into my heart. If, bro if three Brotatoes are running at you in a game of Apex, you, you're, you're in trouble. <laughs> By the way, to all of you at home. We're just waiting on four more players to join up and then we will be ready to go. Guys, can we talk about potential similarities and differences between the play styles in America and in the Europe, Middle East and Africa regions? Ooh, I, I think this is kind of a trend across a lot of esports, but you're going to see that some of the NA teams are a little bit more aggressive than some of the EM, EA teams. However, like you had called out, like there are some teams who are kind of just ready to go for it. And depending on how they have changed their play style from Kings Canyon to World's Edge, that could also be a factor in how aggressive they're going to be. Now, what we saw in Kings Canyon was that as far as the meta goes, it was, you know, find center zone and try to hold a building. Because like you said, there was way more cover on Kings Canyon. That's not necessarily the case on World's Edge. So they're going to have to either rotate in with the zone as it kind of comes in and just kind of hold whatever they can on the edge and then next circle comes and they push in a little bit more. Or if that's worked out for them so far, they can try to go for the same thing. But that overall is really going to impact that play style as a whole. I think it's been interesting to see how World's Edge might have uh, impacted on teams' playstyles full stop. Uh, like you were saying, it kind of is kind of what I would describe as calculated aggression. You need to be aggressive on World's Edge but you have to time it at the right times. If you're, especially when you get towards those end circles, there's always going to be a spot in that end circle which is going to be contested for, which everyone wants to hold down, which everyone wants to put themselves in position to pick up the win and put themselves in the most cover. However, you know you have to work your way to that, and only one team can hold that down. So when you do damage, you have to go. You have to be aggressive. You have to try and hold down those spots. That's the difference here, I think, for the European region. They were very comfortable rotating early back on Kings Canyon. They like to set up. They like to then just play from there and and get towards that end zone and kind of fight for that win. The fact that we don't have that cover, the fact that we have a complete change of map has forced a change of play styles now. And as we, as I said, it's very interesting for us to watch as, as analysts and as commentators to see how these teams develop their strategy from what we had back in Poland in a competitive setting to a competitive setting now on World's Edge. Looking at what I know from other Battle Royale titles, I know that some teams often favor playing from the edge, some like to take center control right from the start. Can I expect to see that here in Apex Legends as well? And do you think some of those tendencies have changed over time for different teams? Absolutely. I think not only will some of the drops that we're going to be seeing teams doing on the map kind of inform how their play style will, will then progress throughout the game, but a lot of teams have to figure out what works best for them. You know, if they were comfortable being aggressive, maybe they do want to rotate in as early as possible and hold the center and just be prepared for everybody to kind of collapse on them and they'll be fine. And we're going to see that out of some of the teams, but other teams might have found whether it's because of their legend comp, whether they made the, ch the change with, with um, Gibraltar or not, or just what did and didn't work in previous events they might have changed because of those reasons. It's also because of the fact that the end circles are becoming more unpredictable mm -hmm. than what we saw on King's Canyon. You know, on King's Canyon, you could pretty much tell from the second circle where we're going to end up and what buildings are going to be involved and what you've got to fight for. Here we're seeing end circles pull in directions that we would never see yeah. back on King's Canyon. It's kind of like, huh, we set up here and if this is King's Canyon, we're good. We know what house it's going to end up in. We know what building we have to protect, what piece of high ground we have to hold down. You can't predict that here as consistently as we saw previously. So it's kind of like you will play for an end circle in the hope that something happens, but then you could find yourself pushed into a choke point because you have to rotate out of where you were towards where you didn't think the circle was going to move to. And that unpredictability 
is what makes it more interesting for me. It's more interesting for us as, as viewers and commentators, analysts. For the players, it makes it absolute <laughs> hell, though. That's where Gibraltar becomes so much more important than a Pathfinder. And it's those little decisions you have to make is the unpredictability makes it more exciting, but it also makes it much more difficult to be consistent as a top team. Yeah, so with regards to those circles then has there been like some level of reverse engineering by people to try and figure out the probability of where circles might end up etc based on where they start and where they begin to move to I mean, the pros are good enough that that happens every single time there's an update with the map as a whole or just even like a patch. And that's what, what happened recently with the most recent uh, change to those end zones. They are trying to do what has worked previously for those end zone predictions. And I think the I think they just kind of got it switched up on them a little bit because they're right probably still like, what, 75, 80% of the time, but then there's just those few outlier situations where they're like, no, it's definitely going to end here, and then say just pulls east. And, and they're like, the oh part. my that's God. That's the fun part for us, because we're like, okay, so uh, for example, uh, G2 is set up perfectly here. They have the only piece of high ground in this end circle, and everyone else is around them. They're like, ha, huh, now they're in the worst position, because we've had an unpredictable circle, and it's like, ah, now this makes it much more interesting, and I kind of feel sorry for them, because they've done <laughs> everything right up to this point, but now they're forced to win a battle that maybe previously they didn't think about winning. Well, guys, thank you so much for your input. I can't wait to get to know you both better and get your input and whatever else over the course of the weekend. But for now, we have to head over to our castle because match one of the day is ready. Bravo and Dreadnought, take it away. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Paula. And of course, thank you also, Glitter and Onset, for breaking down all the things we have to look forward to. And, and of course, even more, just as they alluded to on the Death Stred. We've got a ton of stuff we're going to cover. We are going to be here all night. Not only do we have six matches for Europe coming up, but after that, six more matches yep. for North America. And like we said, tons of Apex games coming tonight. And Dredd, you and I are looking forward to breaking down. I mean, we spent the last week just talking about the sheer number of topics and, and, and new things to look forward to in this tournament. Yeah, it feels, uh, you know, like there is so much kind of vast landscape to kind of cover for this tournament it's kind of like i just want to go over it all right now right but you're like okay but we got some games you know pace it out here yep. figure it out but i think for me uh the map and i mean clearly has to be a major talking point i sure. personally think it is a colossal difference in uh, basically in how you have to approach the game in and of itself uh clearly you still need to you know have effective shooting and rotations but the timing around those i think needs to like heavily shift uh to the earlier section of the game due to the again working on King world's edge over king can certainly and it's a, it's also i think maps a great place to start because you think about how much map impacts things like you just mentioned, like playstyle, but also going to come down to Legend Select. How do teams, our teams early rotate? Are they going to go for a path because they're early rotate? If yeah. they're playing a little bit slower, more methodical, are we going to see more Gibby in EU like we've talked about? Yeah. Uh, and even down to, which we'll get into, uh, a lot of the weapon decisions that are made, right? We're seeing less mid-range fights overall, things like that. Uh, I think the map is the perfect starting point, and it's going to impact down to every single tactical decision that's made by these teams. Yeah, and I think I'd be willing to even say right now, you know, part of the reason Gibraltar is a part of the conversation, though I've been a guy going, you know, I think it's just one tweak away from being a scary character, I think that part of the reason that tweak wasn't him as much as the environment and where we're playing. Yeah. And I actually think, uh, you know, clearly he had massive buffs that genuinely, genuinely helped his appeal. Uh, but specifically, World's Edge and how many chokes there are, that especially with the early, un, uh, with the buff version of the charge rifle, no one could survive except for Gibraltar. Just right. throw down the bubble, defend out your team, and make a rotation that was impossible before, no matter the character. Uh, very, very viable there. Again, outside of maybe if you use a Wraith Portal. But if you're using a Wraith Portal for for every decision you make, it's expensive. There, there are not enough, yeah. uh, you know, accelerants in the world. Like, plus, no. if you have a wraith, like, eh, who gets these? You yeah. know, there's a lot to figure out. Absolutely, and also interesting is uh, you kind of have the two sides of that coin. If we look at the pick rates between Gibby and Path and Scrims coming up, they've kind of been ranging from. Uh, close to a 50% split in yeah. a few T1 scrim weeks, uh, which is the most extreme we've seen. More so, though, something like a 75-25. But Path being the other side of that coin, you and I talked about before this tournament, just how this map really doesn't, you don't have a lot of get out of jail zips yeah. like you did on King's Canyon. So we're actually kind of seeing Path also having a little bit less advantage on yeah. World's Edge as well, which helps Gibby kind of come more into the frame. Yeah, it's actually, uh, it's kind of, 
almost counterintuitive uh, how, when I originally started thinking about the thought process because it is it is very true. Pathfinder doesn't have the same appeal, but I think the first instinct and feel that a lot of people get when they enter World's Edge for the first time post King Canyon was this thing is massive. Yeah. And so with that, you go massive distance uh, and kind of any way to travel at a high pace is going to be very, wow. very appealing. Yeah. Uh, but the kind of, again, paradoxical approach is the more distance that you increase, it can hit a certain amount of distance that no zip line is going to really give you an advantage with that rotation. You're still on the downside. Right. And if that distance kind of reaches that, if it reaches that distance, then suddenly creating a dome and being able to create your own environment right. is actually more viable than yeah. the path itself. And also be exciting to see so many of these differences uh, in, in play style between Europe and North America. Uh, we've yeah. heard anecdotally from pro players, simply you look at the TSMs of the world, you look at the Sentinels of the world, aggro, W key, we're going to see it. We expect to see that continue. Yeah. On the Europe side, we're seeing slower, more methodical play. Yeah. Gibby totally l lands within that play space as well. Yeah. Uh, and that is also going to play into weapons, which we're going to keep an eye on too. But it would be very interesting to keep an eye on these two regions now that they're playing separately. The last time we saw them on a stage, these lobbies were both were all global lobbies in Poland, yeah. and it's very different today. And it's actually it makes me a little bit sad just because uh, just for the sake of exploring the differences within the culture and the ideas behind and how the they gaming. Clash. Exactly, yeah. because I would argue I think World's Edge complements European playstyle and thought processes better than Kings Canyon. I think the flashy in-your-face W uh, was more promoted on Kings Canyon than that of World's yeah. Edge. So I'd be willing to say you know Onset was highlighting the strength of Europe when looking at Poland because they were actually the more dominant region as a whole, mm -hmm. uh, though they didn't walk. Way with the win, and I can't help but feel like this is one of those moments where it eke a little bit better in their favor. Yeah. Do that methodical, I think, mid-game play that World's Edge is going to demand. And we say this, still yet to watch this tournament unfold, but I am pretty confident that that's going to be a factor that plays at hand here today. Right. Yeah. And excited to see. Also, on World's Edge, we had, a, excuse me, on Kings Canyon, we had kind of teams really being able to be picked off early game, maybe some early battles, things like one or two teams. We're seeing largely due to these open spaces, you got a lot more teams dying at the same time. And those, yeah. those team counts are kind of getting chunked. There's four less teams, right? Yeah. There's three less teams. Uh, so another thing that we're going to see, which is just another example of how this map is impacting, obviously, every aspect. Of yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, on that note of like how they're kind of dying and things like, again, to further the point that we heard from Onset with that calculated aggression, mm -hmm. it, it is very much uh, forced because the distance of the map and the way that the circles do function is that it is hard to be able to reasonably defend that mid consistently. And so you have those moments where you do have to go with the, we have to make a bold move at some point. And yeah. it's basically somewhere over this three minute window, we're going to make this choice um, and have to decide. And I personally, I think I'm going to be more of an advocate, at least until we have enough sample size to argue otherwise, of the earlier the better. Yeah. Um, I'm of the assumption, at least for right now, that World's Edge. Uh, there are things called lose-lose scenarios on this map, which wasn't absolutely true, um, though major disadvantages in one way or another on Kings Canyon. Yeah, you think about Kings Canyon, if it, and anyone who got a substantial amount of playtime on the map, you think back to things like, you know, if you're mid-river, let's just, instead we can go caves. We could take the long way around. We could do these types of rotations. We can go all the way through. You know, you can go flank up past the cage. There's all these options now. If we're jumping into game number Ooh. one here, folks, in the European side of the tournament and now taking a look at things and who else to start with exactly. but Luminosity Gaming. It is an exciting kickoff here with Luminosity. X789 here. Tasanya himself here with Exens and Esdesu. Let's see where they end up dropping towards World's Edge. To be completely frank, I forgot we, what their choice was we within actually, Kings Canyon. Yeah, actually, let's see. So where were I? Oh, man. I want to say they were, I want to say they were south on Kings I, Canyon. I, all right. But we'll have to see here. We actually haven't tracked too. We, we do have a few uh, drops on the European side for these teams that we've been tracking in scrims. Luminosity, one that we haven't seen a terribly consistent drop from, but right now oh, it looks like it's going baby. to be. It's an refinery! Is it, are they going all the way? I ate pings on uh, refinery? No, I think they're going epicenter. Hey, Look at this. Uh, where are we going, boys? Let's see. I think it's a high epicenter into a refinery okay. move after the zip line. After we'll find a, out. Maybe a few grabs here. They scout epicenter and then just head up north. Either way, the fact that refinery was the call, this is something that yep, we got uh, things on refinery. Me and Glitter specifically were talking about is like one of the more fun, at least on a solo queue perspective, places that drop. There's a lot of insane yep. uh, loot to be able to pick up in that area, but it's so far away on yep. the outskirts of the map. And right away, it's a scout grab. We are also talked to, talking to some pro players this past week, just getting their thoughts on the game so far, the state of the game. Hearing more 
scout usage in Europe. We've actually heard that VP has been bringing three scouts into the mid game. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, I know you're a huge fan of that weapon as well. But that was a really cool look. Before we uh, talk about Virtus Pro, just the fact that we already saw a pretty spread drop. Uh, you and I will have a lot more time to talk about it throughout this tournament. But uh, that upper, uh, that, that northern, e northeastern side, excuse me, part of the map is going to be really interesting to track, uh, especially when you have a team that like Luminosity that did, a, you know, something we didn't see on Kings Canyon a lot is a split drop where they yeah. actually dropped Epicenter and Refinery. We'll get back to that, though. Lots, of course, to talk about on the opening drops. Here we are now with the Virtus Pro at Lava City. Yeah, the opposite side of the map from the perspective that we just got there. And, oh, look at that for the scout, getting a 4-8 by opportunity there in the optics. And that is extremely beneficial once the double tap is picked up. As long as you have a barrel stabilizer with the yep. double tap, you actually can be threatening at pretty substantial distances with that scout. But if you do not have the barrel stabilizer, you're forced to put it into that single fire. And it's basically the scout of old. You don't gain uh, the advantages going into it. That being said, Noth still unable to find himself a double tap here quite yet as Navi here now a little bit more in the center of the map, Capital City, find themselves pretty well looted here, Bravo. They do. They found themselves now over onto construction. Uh, now as they're going to see if there's any goodies for them there. Navi, of course, second in Poland, one spot away from taking that grand prize, but also did want to point out we did have in scrims both VP and Papega Squadron dropping Lava City. It looks like uh, for one reason or another, in the end, it was Virtus Pro who kind of got claim of the land there at Lava City, but now on board also here as we take a look exactly which side this is. This is going to be Team Hot Drops. Yeah, Hot Drops here. Seems like they found themselves somebody sitting here off on the side. They have the perspective from inside of Sorting Factory, which yep. Sorting Factory is something that I think we're going to be talking about a lot oh, through this yeah. week. It is a very interesting section of the map with a double uh, drone opportunity uh, when looking at the Pathfinder and the scouting capabilities there. Also, when it comes to the actual flyby drones themselves, I've yep. names uh, eluding me here. Cargo but, uh, bots. Cargo bots. There we go. You have two there as well. A third can fly through even. Yep. Uh, it's just a crazy, crazy section of the map with a whole lot of loot. Yeah, and it's a place you're going to see a lot of teams be able to not only balloon out of, but also balloon into. Yes. You've got neighboring balloons at Lava City, Dome, as well as kind of Northern Tree. Uh, so like you said, it, it, not, it might not be in the dead center of the map, but it certainly is uh, an intersection that, that gets a lot of traffic. Not only traffic, but also drops. You know, you can see multiple teams land at sorting and may not even get in an engagement just because there is so much to grab there. Yeah, and here we're taking a look at Fnatic EU. Uh, they're actually sitting on the other side of the sorting factory, sitting a bit on the outskirts, just south there of the fuel depot. Fuel depot probably being one of the more tense areas, I feel like, as we are going to be yeah. eking into the mid game uh, because of the chokes available on the map here. But just making their way out of Skyhook, it's reciprocity. Yeah, this reciprocity EU side, excited to see exactly what they can do. Players, uh, we saw them play under that Penta name. We had seen them with a Fisher drop, and based on this, if they got there fast, they could have still dropped Fisher and got up to Skyhook very quickly, though that would have been a fast rotation. Now they're going to head south through the Skyhook Pass choke into Hill Valley. Yeah. And already the circle is indicating a little bit towards the Sorting Factor Fuel Depot, right? Which is, uh, we were just hinting at, oh, these areas are going to be things we talk about a lot. And the reason for that is because so many rotations do the central area of the map, force people to move through it. Mm -hmm. But even more so than that, there are, again, very, very tense areas that kind of bottle you into a forcing a fight, a corridor where you cannot retreat from. And uh, these teams are just sitting, I feel like, a skosh away from kind of tipping that over to our first element of... Watching that unfold here, as still, we got the, what is it, the Samsung Morning Stars here, sitting just between the south section of Fuel Depot, and again, over towards that sorting factory. Yep, Samsung Morning Stars, 49th at Poland, going to be looking to get themselves back into that higher tier as more part of the conversation after this weekend to play, but now checking once again back in with Navia Depot. And they've got a pretty good setup. These are familiar rooftops for them, right? Even with the circle changes that did come in most recently on in that December 3rd patch, which yeah. we'll also be talking a lot about, the angles that you just saw are angles that they're going to be familiar with, regardless of how this pulls. Yeah, and super concerning here, uh, not when looking at the loadout. My goodness, that scout very prepped there uh, for the roster, but actually the G2 losing themselves already a member here, but Shiv the first kind of quarrel. Yeah. Just going to throw a couple of shots there out of that R99 and the Peacekeeper. This is probably, I think, the, you know, modern day version of the Wingman Peacekeeper of old, right? Whereas yeah. the classic go-to R99 and Peacekeeper, some of the best guns in the game. Only problem, a little bit struggling when it comes to the range. And whoever we saw them sniff out here, taking a look at the other side, it's Soar. They have themselves a charged rifle. Yeah, you saw some shots there. As now, also placing a portal here. And this is... 
certainly one of the, to their back is one of the most difficult chokes uh, that we know about and that they're going to have to certainly make sure that they do not get pushed from that rear. But also, as Onsen mentioned, it's great to see Shiv here. We have not seen him in a high-level play, but of course caught a lot of his stream as that next zone pulls in even tighter towards that center around sorting. Good, I don't know. Things Honestly, the fact that they were willing to burn the Wraith portal just to get a rotation from building to building, I felt like that was a little bit too early, a little bit too safe. Yeah. Uh, considering, I know we're sitting here with kind of the God's eye view, knowing more than them, right? But the charge rifle into what we only saw was a mere close range perspective. Not willing to test the waters a little bit longer, to me, shows a bit of a lack of confidence here within the play out of our sword roster here so far. That being said, you know, you could, it's game one, you know? It's literally kicking this tournament off. You want to just maybe let a couple deaths go, figure out your shots a little bit beforehand but they found themselves a Watson. And again, right now, Bravo, we have like four teams sitting yep. just outside of that sorting factory choke. We, yeah, and you actually saw a team that was Watsoned up there. I don't remember exactly who it was in that tunnel, but there's going to be certainly some pressure on that southern side of uh, Fuel Depot. But now back over to Gambit here at sorting. This is where you want to be at sorting, right? Uh, sometimes we see teams that are actually forced into the top of the stairs. If the teams are sharing the sorting roof, you might see them Watson up at the top of the stairs on the north side and the south side. However, Gambit has made the right plays that have led them to own the entire rooftop yeah. at sorting. Even though you're a bit Exposed, you really do have the best vantage around uh, vantage and sight lines around the whole map, and it's really easy to disengage as well. You can watch, you can always Watson up in the top of the stairs, but holding that rooftop is really important. Yeah, it gives you that bird's eye view, the 360 that is necessary to make the proper decisions. Also allows you to threaten off from the banana building, right? That kind of U shape that sits along the side of Sorting Factory. Yeah, probably one of the longest buildings I think in all of Apex Legends, uh, at least out of the two maps we've gotten so Certainly. far. Yeah. And uh, here back over with VP. Still sitting with the scout, but no double tap in this circumstance. So uh, though the scout has never been bad, right? Yeah, it's not like you cannot pick up the scout if you don't have the double tap. But in my opinion, it does lose a lot of that long-term value for the team if you do not have that. Because you lose the mid to close range threat that makes it a late game weapon. I mean, we've seen so many clips, whether it's a, on Twitch or on Twitter, just of absolute domination with that close range scout. If you know how to use it. As an assault rifle, it's nutty. It, it can really uh, destroy. Talking about the choke right here, this is the choke we were talking about earlier that's so hard to get through one of the tightest there uh, on the map. If you take a look there now here once again with the side of streaming. And there's the Ferrari beach side, three Italian players. By the way, I do want to mention, you do hear a little bit of team communication. Depending on how the stream is sent to the studio on a few of the POVs, we might be hearing player communication, which is always exciting. So, so during certain times, if things are picking up, we're also going to go ahead and listen into those player comms now, but on the Ferrari beach side with the Italian squad. Especially when we get over to North America, where we can understand what's going on a little bit easier there. Uh, but Gambit... They look all right. You know, this is, again, you were talking about the, complimenting their positioning. That as for right now, if you were to say who is in an ideal circumstance, it would be fair to put Gambit near uh, the top. But I do think that there are still a lot of uh, moments to prove themselves still left with this because we are yet to see that first kind of, uh, you know, breaking sure of the dam is. almost. That is, it feels like it, the tension is building on the outskirts here of the sorting factor. Yeah, but really with those shots from Shiv and then the forced portal, really the only engagement that we've caught on stream. Of course, 20 squads still up left, so that tells us that Nothing that has been, uh, like you said, uh, well, look at this. in the glass so far. But here's a push across banana. Yeah, Shiv is moving across the banana building, which should be an easy scout. The fact the shots have not come in onto them while it, scouting the move all the way through here, while they're holding the top of Sorting Factory building, is very, very concerning. And look at, yep. And they, they just slide right in. And maybe that, as we said, it's a lot of ground to cover. And maybe one team holding Sorting, it's, you know, you truly have a 360 degree view of several hot spots on the map. Uh -oh. Now the shots are coming in there. It looks like there was an angle that's held, but it looks like another team. This is now VP, who also has an angle on whoever's in that southernmost sorting dome. But notice the thought process here for VP is Ooh. very, very different. Is already not doing work here with the scout. And keep in mind, Noth was a great scout player before the scout got buffed or tweaked in any way, shape, or form there. But they're taking a non, you know, kind of vertical approach here. More worried about the Watsoning up using these crates to defend it and make smart decisions here. I, I like this play from VP. It allows them to play a little bit slower, but it may force that next rotation to be a bit of a struggle without any high ground advantage. As we take a look, exchanging just some more shots. Already a portal thrown down there, so it looks like even more pressure is coming in. They might actually be getting pushed up there, whichever squad that is. That We also saw Shiv putting pressure on as well. VP aware that to the north in these buildings, there's also at least one or two teams set up. Pretty great place, excuse me, for that Watson ult. Going to be very difficult for any team to try to come in and shoot that down from any sort of angle. And this is where I would like to put the question of when does VP rotate as a very, very high priority here. They do find themselves possibly one victim down in the outskirts. 36 goes in under no armor, but it seems like they will be able to shield up in the downtime. Arcstar attempt coming out. It was a good toss there from PJ. 
but not enough. Actually, was it enough? I thought for a second we might have gotten into the kill feed. Either way, it doesn't matter here as Luminosity find themselves on the back foot. Peacekeeper comes through and ends up getting one knock. It seems now two versus two as Casper ends up moving up. Let's see now if they can make this happen here in the dome. Can slow heal up as well. Good shots here. Tries to end up going for that thirst, but not enough to confirm. Punches come through. That's 14. That's a crack under the Gibraltar. He shoots into his own shield. He shoots again into his own shield, but he's going to be met with the ADS, ADS shield. Enough to get the knock, but there's still somebody alive here for Luminosity. The pinks came through, and it was too late, though. As Desu clutches it out How for the team. How many times have we seen her do it? It's actually a little wild. How many times everybody on the roster of, Lu roster of Luminosity is struggling, and as Desu's like, check it. I got it. Yeah, I'd say if there was one player, based on what we've seen so far in Bristol Apex Legends, that I would want to be in a 1v1, 1v2, you name it. Uh, as Destu, she is the one that has clutched up time and time again, and they will live to continue to play, and they will come out of that battle on top now, checking in with Soar as well. Pretty good defensive position here. Come back to... Yeah, I'm they have the upper hand to be able to get, keep this team out. The Gibraltar should bubble. You can see there's a lot of argument for Gibraltar and the value of him already here in game number one of our series. Overpowered is staying a little bit far forward compared to the rest of the team. 50% on the shielding. We'll take this time to be able to shield up himself along with IPN. It's only a matter of time here as the circle will be closing in. They've got about two minutes to decide what they're going to do. But with that crack, they should be able to push. Looks like that's going to be the case here, Bravo. Yep, even put down the Gibby shield as well just in case they need to retreat. It's going to force a Phoenix here for Lagger. He's going to have to drop all the way down. Yep, Excafu does go down. Lots of goodies down here. I'll see exactly. We're checking in back. I, I believe, yes, back in with Luminosity. They're all back looted up, but it looks like in the end that's going to be Sword that also gets one more knock. So yeah. now trying to find exactly where these next players might be hiding. Lagger, as we said, he's in a tough oh, spot. Oh, no! Makes that arc. He's going to try to get away back into Sword. Can he do it? I don't know how. He's got to heal right now if he's going to have any opportunity to do it. I don't think he makes it out, and he no, will not. No, he's not. That med Good needed night. to go off a while ago, and it's going to be Jazz, actually, who's still up for the squad. We'll it see if we can see exactly what Jazz is up to trying to squeeze something out of nothing with that great pressure. He is a Gibraltar, so I was going to say he might that's have an opportunity to be able to bubble and keep it alive, but that's not the case. G2 here, down a man very early yep. and not a problem as they end up out surviving at least two of our squads here. Just trying to eke themselves at least into the point and placement situation to where they can gain themselves some pointage there. But one on the board there for Rhett here. That's going to be the first two squads that we do fall as a reminder that G2 side. We saw them playing, of course, under the Reciprocity banner previously alongside Snipe Down. Then we saw him pulling them going back with Rhett, Mimu, 0 0 and Rhett teaming up in Poland. Their Poland placing was seventh. So pretty impressive. And they're going to uh, continue, look to continue to be at the top of the boards here in the GLL Apex Legends series. Yeah, and so you, you talked look earlier about the which staircase you know you can get around here with the Sorting Factory House. And this is actually going to force them out of that positioning on the next circle. A minute and five seconds until we do see Reciprocity forced to make a decision. They don't have very many buildings to be able to no. get behind. And they have to deal with VP, who's not even taking a main structure with circle advantage on their side. Double zip towards the high ground. Only one's going to be easily accessible for anybody who may want to push into VP. But VP here doing what they do best, having very slow and calculated play with those circles. And look at Shiv. He's in a tough spot. All sorts of caustic gas all around everywhere. Don't we actually get a look at, let's see exactly. He's actually, it's his, his own friendly, caustic. It is friendly count the caustic gas. Yes, indeed. Now back on board with Sunset. Like we said, they have now been forced off of their roof. They're now on top of the staircase. But I think all these teams are around sorting. As you saw that circle start to pull, they knew that their time at sorting was limited. Yeah, and Alliance has identified that. They're actually going to get themselves a caustic ultimate outside. So two caustics in this game in and of itself. But it's not enough to get that not quite yet. Lowly unable to make it up that staircase. 13 seconds till the circle's going to move in. They have to get this res if they're going to do it. The attempt is going to come through. Healing opportunity after this. And then they need to make their way out. And we know what is waiting once they break these corners. So many people on the other side. We'll see what they can make happen. Let's see. Uh, right there you saw Hockey's just blocking for that revive. He's able to hold the stairs down just long enough. They do get the Phoenix off as well. And that's going to give them an opportunity, presumably, to try to head back up as they're going to start to shoot out these fences. Watson did end up hitting one, though. So everybody knows that whatever team set that up knows that they're making the transition through here. They find themselves they one. Go. Shots go through. That's going to be G2. Only one other member of G2 is alive here. So easy cleanup for this transition for Alliance. And we see that zip is set up, but we VP is sitting on the other side. Not much room for Alliance here. Like VP has not moved. And I think this is a great example right here, Dread, of teams on this open map being forced to create their own kind of zones this with those Watson fences that really you wouldn't have seen on King's Canyon. Yeah, and that's where the Gibraltar might be able to give you value, but you need to get the bubble close enough to get 
get that gap closed completely, and that first one's not the case. VP, though, getting flanked by multiple teams at this point. One attempting on the backside of this, but it seems like Noth has what it takes with his R99 and Scout clean up on the ground there, just making sure to rid of any fodder. Still a target behind them, but VP isn't too concerned here as a majority of those entering from that factory seem to be the focus point. And look at this uh, end circle. I don't know if we could have asked for a better example of the new end circles, right, that are totally wide open. As we, as you heard Onset talk about in the desk, a lot of these teams are still figuring out a, a lot of the rhyme and the reason between how these end circles are moving. You've seen a lot of posts on Twitter about different end circles that are ending in the widest open areas or just essentially areas that would not have been expected. A little bit of a suicide bomber here with Wraith goes flying in as they try to push down. Great shots there. And we'll go ahead and see if they're able to push that up. Look at that push amazing that we just saw. Amazing from Hot Drops. That was an absolutely amazing play. For anybody who didn't know what just happened, Watson ended up sticking her own Wraith to be able to ensure that the damage would come through. Basically, you know, a kamikaze like teammate there moving through and then having the opportunity to take that trade on their side. For real, the double positioning of him and Taskmaster to move in, that was very clean play here from a roster that I don't think too many people know much about. Right, and I've seen that go very different in scrims. <laughs> yeah. I've seen the I've seen that play with the Wraith stick go very different. But speaking of, look at this. Now, Kashera for Lazarus also doing the same play as they go ahead and try to drop in. Doesn't go well, though. Kashera drops immediately. He has to back down. Might even get finished by the path. Thermite's out as well, though, so that's going to slow things down for just a moment. But as long as they keep them trapped in this house, that's all that matters, at least for this point in time, because they've got the circle closing in, and that circle is inevitably going to cover this home in only a matter of seconds. This is Wizen, by the way. This is a c combination of Triumph and Succubus that we saw in Poland, their highest placing between the two was 19th on the side of Succubus. R99, clean spray there. That's gonna be an easy kill on the post kill, but they ended up sliding out into That's the it. circle and taking enough damage. No longer gonna be with us here, but Virtus Pro still looking very good. Eight squads now remain here as we end up rounding round number six. We saw VP and Gamers Origin Ooh. in a the battle there as well. I believe that's actually Gamers Origin out as well at the hand of VP that we just saw. VP is in a very safe positioning right now, as long as they aren't too threatened from some of the shots going through that fence on the other side. But it's very important to note, like, once they get past, they have a lift to jump down. And once they do, they're kind of stuck on that side. And right now, we do see the high ground on this side is going to be the control point. This is going to be one of the biggest elevation deltas in an end circle that we might see this weekend yeah. oh. that I've seen certainly in a lot of the scrims that I've watched. We don't always see it right on the edge of a cliff like this. There's not, if you look at the entire map, there's not a lot of small areas that can end up just like this. So big, big elevation disparity. And notice how the team, who, I believe, who just had the high ground, the perspective we were looking at, they actually didn't have a Gibraltar. This is one of those moments where Gibraltar can really change the outcome over this final circle. If you have the low ground, just throwing down his ultimates enough to be able to deter them, maybe force the advance downward. Fnatic trying to get a res opportunity. Honestly, the fact that they got the knock through that res attempt, very concerning there is Bedoli. Seems like they're comfortable understanding that this may be the beginning of the end. He goes for the push out. He's going to get himself his own shielding, trying to use that knockdown shield to help the team keep up, and that's Virtus Pro just chipping away. Yeah, VP is all sitting pretty. They've also got these angles through the chain link fence. It's going to let them, like you said, just chip away continually with that scout. Force heals that the other side may not have wanted to spend. Seven seconds, and Virtus Pro has a lot to figure out over these next couple of seconds here, Bravo. They do, and PJ, of course, with that path, are they going to try to make a play? Looks like Zip's already down. That has to be their, a recent Zip, so that will be it spent, and we'll see exactly if and when they take it now. They're going to have to go right now. They end up going across here. Shots going on to Knopf, just trying to get that Zip juggle as best he can. Can he make it to the other side? Oh, no. Up. Easy cleanup there. Luminosity down below, just wreaking havoc, as that is once again to Sonya, taking the kill there with the Devotion. Easy the cleanup goes for the armor swap and looking good. Yes, indeed. Gets that swap. He's able to pull back with that med kit as well. Those that, yeah, it looks like he knows there's pressure coming from low, and he's still getting chopped from up top. Keep in mind, that dome is down. Exxon's matters so much because he is the only Gibraltar alive in this final circle, at least from what I've seen so far, and that is Exxon's right there. If Exxon's yep. can get alive and get that ultimate off, it may change the outcome of this game. There we see the bubble going down. It's Papega Squadron, by the way, that did has gained control of this top area. That's going to be Fjelder and Forsaken uh, and Balanji here. He was willing to swap that R99 for a wing Man without an extended mag, having confidence within the shots and this high ground, trying to know that this is going to be the final circle in initiation. Hits a 35. This area right here is so deadly. There's another one of these, of course, a few of them across the other side of the map, all the way towards Spring's Edge, and you can just rain shots down a custom-built hole that gives you such great sight lines into the bottom of the map. They're going to keep holding this platform. And Watson also just got an ultimate available, so now the Gibraltar not nearly as threatening unless they can maintain that actual high ground in and of itself, and it doesn't seem like they will. Is that as Exxon's out there with the golden knockdown, that Thermite will kill him, along with the Circle. 
Still 52 seconds there. And they're just going to keep raining down shots. As somehow, we said it about 7, 8, 9 in Poland. Now we're saying about Luminosity Gaming as well. Somehow they're still alive in the worst position yeah. you could ask for. Absolutely. And we've seen wilder things happen with this roster. They're Look at this. They get risky. They take the double jump down here. They're going all in. Confidence here coming out from the roster. Pittsburgh Storm, they end up getting knocked. Luminosity, are they going to make miracles happen once more? It's the one versus one. It's Forsaken up against, I think that's Exxon's. That's going to be it. And yes, I do. I do believe Papega Squadron is going to be our champion there in game number one as they drop down along with the rest of the lobby what to the happen? bottom of the map. Why? Wait, wait. I, 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 I need I a so rewind. Many... What, what, when did it become a Leroy Jenkins moment? Everybody was ready to go. So I thought what we were seeing was... Papega Squadron leaving Fjeldern up top while the rest of the team dropped, maybe sent two down. Yeah. yeah. And in the end, everyone said, we need to be on the bottom of the map right now. Let's forget this <laughs> elevation. And they're going to take game uh. number one. But somehow, always part of the conversation is Luminosity Gaming. We saw yeah. them do it time and time again in Poland. Like we said, fighting from uh, a position that I can't believe they were even able to stay alive that long. I mean, wingman shots raining down, thermites raining down. Yeah. Uh, really great timing there on between the ults as well as uh, the Gibby tack. Um, managed to stay alive that long and once again gets himself a second place. But it's performances like that from the Luminosity side that keeps them towards the top of the table. We've got to yeah. talk about Papega Squadron there. Uh, what a Hail Mary play. And I can't, I, we got to see replays of that. I'm going to be, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be checking uh, yeah. to see what on earth happened. No, I, I really want to break that down because you are right. It did look almost like a 2-1 two, two split where yep. two drop down and leave one up above. But it's like if the call was to get all in, yep. why risk the one guy up above, right? Like was that yeah. valuable enough to be able to justify that? But I don't know. It would be interesting to see how that played out. But either way, I think the fact that they were willing to jump down, question marks, you know, was that the right call? Was it not? I think the fact that even Luminosity, that that final trade wasn't just a watch them kill as they drop down. That, those are the moments for me that really impressed me with that roster. It's They win fights they shouldn't somehow. Yeah, absolutely. Excited to see exactly what that Luminosity side can do. But the story is really all about Papega Squadron. Guys on the desk, uh, you're probably just as surprised as we are about the Hail Mary Leroy Jenkins. Leroy! To that you game. love to see oh, it. So what are, what, yeah, what, uh, what did... Did you guys see something we didn't? Yeah. Because apparently there was a there was a, a memo that we missed about flying to the bottom. Uh, you saw it all. I think it was a uh, it was the all or nothing, or actually not all or nothing. Kind of just slowly dripping themselves down the map and falling down. And it, it, at least it worked for them, right? Otherwise, we would have been probably ripping themselves apart, right? Yeah. Uh, ripping them apart right now. But it worked for them. Eventually, it was close. It made it more difficult than it maybe it had to be. But maybe first game nerves, tournament nerves. I feel like in situations like that. Taking affirmative action is really important. Trying to impress your will on the game. Maybe that's a bit of what we saw there. Yeah, dictate the pace rather than letting it come to you. Probably. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, guys, for that brilliant cast. We'll now discuss what just transpired on the desk. Let's start with you, Glitter. Going back to the point that I just raised, um, talking about the very end of the match, how did things play out? Okay, first of all, I know we just kind of touched on it a little bit, but I don't think that Papega had any other option other than to drop down on them in the aggressive manner that they did. They had literally the high ground on every other team that was in the bottom of that end zone, and they were watching them fight it out, which is a smart thing to do. They were tossing down thermites every once in a while, making sure that people were knocked, were taking a little bit of extra damage here and there. They were able to get some nice wingman shots in on, on, on x right? They knocked him down pretty early. So they had to push their advantage when they had it. I know it seemed a little bit wild, but I'm happy with the decision that they made. Yeah, they made the right decision in the end. Obviously, they get the champion's banner, and they, they pick up the first win in the game. Uh, it was one of those where, you know, when the guys were, were commentating there and they were discussing, you know, you could see the call was made and maybe one player just slightly hesitated in, in hearing that call and committing to it and listening to the IGL and saying, we're going. And he was like, wait, we should we should wait a few. And that little bit of second hesitation almost cost them. But I mean, it's all about positioning, isn't it? And they had the, the complete and utter control of that end circle. The one thing you want to do if you're in an end circle and there's three teams alive still and you have the best position on the map is let the other two fight first. Let the other two do damage and then you come in and you clean up. And that's what they did. Maybe it wasn't as clean as it could be, but who cares? They won the game. Yeah, we know how powerful third partying can be in situations in Battle Royale. It looked like they really exploited an opportune moment there, Glitter. Absolutely. And I think that this is the type of start that they want to. They know that if you come out of the gate really, really strong, not only are you putting your team in a better mental state to do well moving forward, but you're also kind of throwing a lot of those teams off of their own footing. I don't think that in game one, a lot of those teams were expecting Papega Squadron to come out as strong as they did and 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 LG squeaking through until the end like that like that that's a great start were there any expectations for Papega Squadron before this match I mean can you tell me a bit about this team 
I mean, if you would have asked me before this match who is going to win the game, <laughs> how Papega, much money would have been on Papega? We would have gone through a lot of names okay. before getting to Papega squad, but it shows what you can do if you can get an early rotation on the map. And they were holding down that position for us a long, long time. And we were talking a lot about rotations, and we had a perfect example of how an unpredictable circle can cause problems for teams having to fight into late game. If we we were both saying here, after the second circle, I think it's like fuel depot. Maybe it's going to end up there. Maybe it could pull towards Sorting Factory. And we're okay, okay, the teams are kind of split here. We can see who's in position, who's holding down certain areas. If we go back to Kings Canyon and after that second circle, we're like, we know it's finishing fuel. Like, th that is finishing fuel depot. We know where it's finishing. And you can see teams are set up there just predicting that it could be a fuel finish. But then you also saw teams who were thinking, it might not be, actually. We're going to set up around sorting. Like, VP was set up around sorting, and, and they were trying to fight in that way. So it's so interesting to see how the unpredictability of the circle can decide who our top 10, who our top 5 is in comparison to Kings Canyon. World's Edge really does give us that different dynamic than what we saw in the previous season. Glitter, any final thoughts before we head to a break? I mean, to, just to be fair to Bepega Squadron, they are all former BR players. They've played in other titles and they do have LAN experience. They maybe didn't do as well as they would have wanted in Poland, but I think they kind of got their gear, their, got, got their butts in gear and now they're good to go. Absolutely. Well, everybody, that will Court to bring to a conclusion match number one, Papega Squadron going away with the champion's banner. Everything finishing in fuel, setting the battlefield alight. Do not go anywhere. We'll be back in four minutes.